Welcome to another episode of Auto Monday Out, the weekly car news and review show where this week we have fun on two wheels as well as four with the latest Triumph Scrambler. We also check out the new Porsche 911 Turbo and the latest plug-in hybrid Range Rover Velar. Plus a rugged new city car from Audi and Hyundai's new i20. It's fair to say the latest BMW 4 Series hasn't exactly been winning any beauty contests this year. But the Bavarian brand is ploughing on regardless, revealing both the new M4 and the 4 Series convertible complete with the now familiar enormous nostrils. Thankfully, it retains a decent side profile and inoffensive rear end, although this time round the 4 Series convertible sports a fabric roof rather than the folding metal arrangement you got on the old car. BMW reckons the new soft top is 40% lighter than the old metal roof and the increase in road noise and thermal insulation is barely noticeable. It can be operated at speeds of up to 31 miles per hour in 18 seconds. But despite its new fabric roof, the new convertible is stiffer than the old car thanks to some extra bracing. Entry-level 2.0-litre 420i models start at a little over £45,500, with top-spec 440i versions kicking off at nearly 59000 When considering a new Super Mini, it can be easy to forget about all but the big names. The Vauxhall Corsa, Ford Fiesta, VW Polo and Renault Clio tend to dominate the sales charts in Europe, while the Nissan Micra and Toyota Yaris sit on the fringes of the market. In recent years, though, Korean brands Kia and Hyundai have been making greater and greater inroads into the small hatchback class with cars like the Rio and the i20. When the second-gen i20 shot into showrooms in 2014, its interior and exterior refresh gave it a much more desirable and grown-up look than earlier versions. But it never quite felt up to the task of taking on the headline axe. Now, though, there's a new one, and it has the Fords, Volkswagens and Renaults firmly in its sights. This is the top spec for now, the N-Line. We say for now because Hyundai's N-Division is currently fettling with the little i20 to bring us a souped-up version, which should rival the Fiesta ST and Polo GTI. Externally, the new model is larger and lower than the outgoing version, and the wheelbase is longer too. That means you get the i20's spacious interior, bags of tech and safety features, and all within a fantastic looking package. Its styling makes the VW Polo look run of the mill with its aggressive black grille, sharp, piercing headlights, and the Audi-esque air vents we saw on the Kona. This intimidating styling continues at the back with a gloss black diffuser, chrome twin exhausts and the same triangular fog lights we saw on the i30N hot hatch. And the improvements continue on the inside. There's now a pair of 10-inch digital screens, one behind the new steering wheel and the other above the centre console for infotainment. It's also got some of the best tech in the segment. Cruise control can be paired with the sat-nav to adjust to changing speed limits, as well as lane assist and anti-lock brakes. Under the bonnet, there's a range of petrol engines available, many of which are carried over from the old model. However, Hyundai has fitted a 48-volt mild hybrid system, which helps recover energy under braking and under acceleration. Top spec cars get a 119 brake horsepower, 1 litre, 3 cylinder motor, although the i20N is expected to have up to 200 when it's revealed next year. So, how else does it compare with its headline rivals, the Ford Fiesta and VW Polo? Well, on a styling standpoint, we think the Hyundai comes out on top. While the Ford and the VW remain chic and inoffensive, the i20 really manages to stand out, particularly in sporty N-Line trim. 
Inside too, the i20 is more spacious and has the same size boot as the VW and much bigger than the Fiesta. So what about under the bonnet? Well, like the Hyundai, the Ford is now available with a 48-volt mild hybrid system. The Fiesta's party piece, though, is no matter which powertrain or trim level you go for, it's a real hoot to drive. Real thought has gone into every detail, meaning you're guaranteed to finish a spirited drive with a smile on your face. The VW, meanwhile, feels every bit as solid and long-lasting as any other car in the brand's lineup. That's to say it feels very grown up. The interior, while not the most exciting to look at, is very well put together with plenty of kits you'd expect to find in much bigger cars. The Hyundai's competition then is as stiff as it ever has been, but this time we think it could finally move itself to the top of the pack. And from four wheels to two now, with the latest Triumph Scrambler. The Scrambler 1200 comes in two flavours, XC and XE. The XE is the one that we're going to talk about the most. That's this one here, the massive long travel suspension, really cool thing, and the XC. Just as cool, but a little bit smaller and easier to live with every day. Dry, this bike is 207 kilos, has a 16 litre tank, nearest damage 225 kilos, you've got 88 pounds foot of torque, 81 horsepower, and a host of rider software, a host of things to help you enjoy your experience on this bike. Cornering ABS, cornering traction control, a ridiculous TFT screen that houses everything, multiple riding modes, five on this I think, including Off-Road Pro, which turns all of your rider aids off, ABS, traction, all off. It's got stacks of stuff, LED lights everywhere, cruise control, heated grips, loads. It's got the lot. So the Scrambler 1200 motor, what's going on with it? It is Thruxton and Bobber based, but there's a, a specific tune that's gone into the bike to suit the nature of what this bike does. Also, they've halved the throttle bodies. There's only one now, slightly smaller, which they've done in an effort to reduce the width of the bike across the frame in order to fit that sweet looking Scrambler exhaust that flows along the side of the bike. I'm not gonna use the word iconic because it's it is what it is. If you think about scramblers, you can see pipes running along the sideline of the bike. It was vital that this bike had those pipes in order to tick the scrambler box. This thing and the XC, but in particular the XE, are incredibly capable bikes. Felipe Lopez is the development guy who worked on the suspension and various other parts of this and lots of other Triumphs. He's the Don off-road. He was absolutely flying on this thing, making it do things that I would struggle to do on a six-day KTM all the proper enduro bikes, he was able to do those things. I've seen that with my own eyes. Once you've gelled with this bike, you can go from peg to peg, you can have loads of fun. It's quite a quick steering bike, considering what it is and the nature of what these bikes are supposed to do. And it just gives you this feeling that it loves being thrashed, because it does. Now what I would do if you're that kind of bloke and you are looking for that kind of experience from your 1200 Scrambler is, tick the exhaust box straight away. I do enjoy this motor and I do think it's great in the bobber, but I think Thruxton and now Scrambler 1200, they need to breathe a little bit easier and just make a little bit more noise, give a little bit more uh, theatre to your ride. I would definitely go for the aftermarket option exhaust with this bike. Hat tip to Triumph for pulling this off. They've managed to deliver a bike that appeals to two very different sectors in the market. When I'm ready to escape next weekend, and I am, it's going to be on one of these. Crossovers seem to be popping up all over the place. It appears that as soon as we feature one, another model is already on the market. The selection can be overwhelming. But these hatchback, SUV, off-road inspired combos are increasingly popular. So you can see why designers are pouncing for their pens and moving to get their new high-riding hatches out to the dealer's ASAP. And this is the latest one from Audi, the A1 City Carver. Based on the existing A1 Super Mini, the City Carver is a more rugged off-road version with chunky trim. With two inches extra ground clearance and an upgraded suspension setup over the base A1, 
the city Carver is placed as an urban crossover rather than a full-on off-road model. The city Carver is teeming with tech in even the entry-level 30 TFSI model. With 17-inch alloys, a matte black front grille, LED headlights and dynamic rear indicators. But then it should be, because it is much more expensive than its closest rival, the Volkswagen T-Cross. Two engines are available, a 1.0-litre and a 1.4-litre, which are both turbocharged. A 6-speed manual and a 7-speed automatic are available, depending on taste. The underbody is protected by a stainless steel panel, just in case you decide to venture off the beaten track. Black wheel arches and sills found on the Audi all-road models contrast with the paintwork, as well as promoting the off-road image. At the back, the rear bumper has had a more rugged redesign, and the roof can be tailored with contrasting colour options. Jump inside, and you are greeted with a 10-inch touch display and Audi virtual cockpit, with voice control via Amazon Alexa. The cockpit is well equipped for both USB and USB-C ports and a great stereo system. You can also customize the colors of the trim via the infotainment system. As you'd expect, the seats and trim panels are all of very high quality. The rear seats offer good space and the boot is huge for such a small car. In most respects, this is just a jacked up A1, but we have to admit that we do rather like the outdoorsy styling. Sure, it's not exactly a Land Rover, but it's fun, cheeky and really rather cool. After the break, a new hybrid Range Rover and the Porsche 911 Turbo. The latest electrified Range Rover, but first. When we first saw the new 992 generation Porsche 911 last year, it's fair to say that we weren't exactly blown away. It was bigger, heavier and less pretty than the model that came before it, but it was packed full of incredible kit and the interior really impressed. We were also pleased to see it was still available with a manual gearbox and that Porsche had, thus far at least, resisted the urge to electrify it. What we were really excited for though was the turbo version. And here it is. This is the new 911 Turbo S with 641 brake horsepower and all the usual turbo styling cues. It gets some turbo specific wheels which are wider at the back than the front and even wider body than standard Carreras with those classic side air intakes. And of course the signature rear wing letting everyone behind you know exactly what you're driving. Porsche has chosen to launch the S version before the standard model, which may seem odd at first. Porsche say, though, that 75% of the previous generation were S cars, making this the more important one. Interestingly, though, Porsche is also planning a lightweight version. Normally, a lightweight 911 means a GT3 or a GT2, a stripped-out, track-based car with a half-cage and bucket seats. But this time, the turbo will be available with less sound insulation and various weight-saving features. This car, though, the Turbo S, is an impressive feat in itself. It's worth bearing in mind that the previous version launched with around 550 horsepower, while this one gets 641 from its 3.8-litre flat six. The 0-62 time has shrunk to 2.7 seconds, while the 205 miles per hour top speed is unchanged. But at this level, even slight gains are impressive. But every little detail has been improved. It now generates more downforce, while the new wet weather mode will make the already infallible all-wheel drive system even less likely to get out of shape in bad conditions. The suspension has been upgraded too, with faster reacting dampers and lower springs. It also retains the four-wheel steering to keep it agile and disguise its bulk. 
its cabin is plusher than ever, with gorgeous leathers and a whopping 11-inch infotainment screen. The turbo has always tipped the 911 into supercar territory, and this one is no different. It'll be competing against Audi R8s and sports series cars from McLaren, but it's priced to match. The coupe starts at around £156,000, with the cabrio coming in at around £9,000 more. But is a supercar with the engine hanging right out of the back still as competitive as it once was? After all, if you want a German supercar for about the same money, the Audi R8 still offers a huge amount of bang for your buck. While the rest of the supercar world downsizes with turbos and hybrid setups, the R8 prefers the sonic growl of a mid-mounted, naturally aspirated 5.2-litre V10. The R8 received a refresh last year, with the V10 performance model putting out 611 brake horsepower and the standard model up to 562. There's plenty of power on tap to reach 62 miles per hour in 3.1 seconds and a top speed of 206 miles per hour. However, the Porsche has heritage on its side and some very loyal customers. The 911 Turbo continues to do things differently while remaining as competitive as ever. For decades now, if you've fancied yourself a posh SUV, there's always been one obvious choice, the Range Rover. With its unique blend of luxury and true go-anywhere ability, it continues to set the standard even in today's crowded SUV market. It's also spawned smaller versions like the Sport, Evoque and this, the Velar. One of the very best looking 4x4s of any size, the Velar combines the Range Rover's premium fixtures and fittings with less emphasis on off-roading, instead being focused towards the vast majority of SUV buyers whose idea of off-roading involves occasionally bumping up onto curbs. And now, ready for 2021, Land Rover has upgraded the Velar with a new plug-in hybrid system. The same setup as found in the new Defender P400e, the Velar PHEV uses a 2.0-litre four-cylinder petrol engine paired up to an electric motor and a 17.1 kilowatt-hour battery hidden away under the floor. Altogether, the PHEV produces a healthy 398 brake horsepower, good for 0-62 miles per hour in 5.4 seconds. Surely, though, the main point of a hybrid is economy. And it's good news here, too, with the WLTP economy figure of up to 130 miles per gallon. For those looking to do big mileage on electric only, though, the Velar can manage just 33 miles on a charge before the petrol motor kicks in. There is a pair of new 3-litre straight-six choices, both equipped with a 48-volt mild hybrid system. The first is a new 298 brake horsepower diesel, replacing the old V6, capable of hitting 62 from rest in 6.5 seconds, with an impressively low CO2 output of just 194 grams per kilometre, with a 398 brake horsepower petrol also on offer. There are also some new smaller diesel options too, but it isn't just under the bonnet where the Velar has been updated. Visual changes on the outside may be limited with just some new paint and alloy wheel options, but inside the changes are more apparent. The old Touch Pro infotainment has been ditched in favour of Land Rover's new PIVI and PIVI Pro systems. There's also a redesigned steering wheel and a new cabin filtration system that can remove bad smells more effectively. However, while the full-size Range Rover might still be the go-to choice for those after a big luxury SUV, the Velar needs to fend off some serious competition. Not least, this, the Mercedes GLE. 
Available as either a proper SUV or a coupe SUV, the GLE has one of the best interiors in this class. The Velars may be beautiful, but the Merck's big screens, brushed aluminium and open pore wood trim make for an extremely luxurious environment. There are a range of petrol and diesel engines to choose from, with a 3-litre petrol mild hybrid being the one to go for, for its blend of performance and economy. However, there's no plug-in hybrid option for now, meaning drivers who prefer silent commuting are better off with the rangey. And it's the Velar in any guise that we choose in this class. Not only does it look fantastic and cause it to you on the road, it's cheaper than the Merc with prices starting at around £45,000. It seems then that the Velar, particularly in PHEV guys, continues the Range Rover tradition of being the go-to choice in its class. Join us again next week on Auto Mundial as we take a look at Nissan's latest sports car, the new Z Proto.